Welcome to the Moser on Manufacturing Podcast, brought to you by Jacket Media Co. I'm just wild about Harry, and Harry's wild about me. The heavenly Good morning, everybody. This is Lou Weiss from Manufacturing Talk Radio, and uh, my buddy Harry Moser. Uh, of uh, Hot Reshoring Initiative, and we do a combined show, Manufacturing Talk Radio, and Mosier on Manufacturing. Today, we're going to be talking uh, a lot, of, obviously, about uh, reshoring, and uh, we're going to be dealing from a different level today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the actions that states and communities uh, can take in view of the federal government not necessarily doing all that they could. Uh, did I say that right, Harry, without insulting either the left or the right? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think pretty close. The, uh, there, there's clearly some things that the communities and states should do, because things that relate to education, that relate to local training, you really don't want the federal government operating locally to do things. On the other hand, uh, the Fed, and the federal government, on the other hand, can help reshoring by get, getting the dollar down somewhat, by 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 invest putting less money into liberal arts university uh, loans and more into loans to help people become apprentices, toolmakers, welders, things like that. So there's things they could do, but 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 the, the communities and states are are where the action is. That, that if you look around the country at where the successful apprenticeship programs and training programs are they're, they're run by the states they're run by the communities all right well let's uh you gave me the sedgway for that so let's uh let's talk about the roles that communities and states and regions can uh do uh compared to what the federal government is uh doing or not doing yeah so, so, yeah, so, so, so if, if you look at what let's say all of them are doing right now everything's focused on everybody going to university if you say, what does a school counselor, what's their job? As I, as I see it, as most people see it, they, they, they tell the student the best university they can get into <laughs> and help, right. them, help them do that. Uh, whereas if, it's clear that for, for, for many of the students, um, they'd be better off going into, a, let's say, an apprenticeship or some equivalent training system because uh, they'll make more money. They'll they'll make it sooner. They won't have the college debt. You put all that together and, and for them and for their families, it's clearly a, a very good solution. And, and for the country, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of you know, liberal arts university graduates and dropouts working in Starbucks, you know, and doing things like that. And, and at the same time, I'm, I suspect you and, and most manufacturers cannot find enough trained people to produce the things that that companies want to produce here in the United States, so so we, we it's clear that the, the the country has misallocated its resources uh, too much education that doesn't lead to a career and not enough training that would lead to a, lead to a very good career. I'll take that one step further, Harry. You said that we can't find people. Well, that's part's true, but when we do find them. And, and right now we're looking also to increase our staff, both on the manufacturing side and the admin side. And we're running ads in uh, Indeed and LinkedIn and so on and so forth. I, we even ran ads on All Metals and Forge Group website. We had so far seven appointments with people that had credible resumes. We made the appointments. And we had seven no shows. Seven no shows. Seven no shows. And I, I don't know if it's that they need to show the unemployment that they actually reached out to somebody <laughs> so they can get their unemployment check. I know that's the way it used to be, but we have more no shows than we do have shows. So it's 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 really a a, a multi sided, uh, multi bladed problem. Because once you get somebody, then they don't show up. I understand. Now, so sort of a related fact, I read somewhere that of the, if you look at our, our high school graduate population and the military uh, evaluates them for 
uh, recruitment into the military, something like half or more are not eligible because of either obesity, drug problems, or some, something else like that that makes them not, not good enough to become a foot soldier in the army, much less become a tool maker you know, at, at one of our companies. And so, so our, our, our families, our, our culture, you know, social media, all, all this has, has degraded our human resources that makes it that much harder f f for the companies and, and, and the cities and states to, to, to uh, develop the, what we need. Let, let me tell you what, one thing I heard recently, a statistic I read, that um, compared to a decade ago, university enrollment is down by 15% and number of apprenticeships is up by about 50, 50%. So we've got, you know, we've got some trends in the right direction that are going to help. The, the problem is that most of those apprenticeship increases are white collar jobs. So, so big, big, big company like insurance, uh, Zurich America, very big insurance company. They have an apprentice program. They bring the kids in and they train them to fill jobs that, that they used to hire more expensive university, university graduates for. Okay. And and, and that, to the kid, that looks pretty good. I get to the same white collar, nice job in the end. I don't have to pay tuition, et cetera. Whereas we need to, to th through the cities and the states, et cetera, we need to convince people that the blue collar job, you know, the, the tool maker, the welder, the precision machinist, the, the for forging system uh, maintenance uh, person, that, that those are equally or, or equal or better jobs. One of the things, and you've heard me say this before in past shows, but I'm saying it for the benefit of those who are watching today for the first time, we have a lousy immigration policy. Lousy. I agree. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't let, we should, we should be finding legal, safe, you know, drug-free, non-criminal people both to come in and do the, the hard work like on the farm, you know, and maybe in your, in your in some shops, and, and but also the skilled technicians and engineers that our student, <clears throat> our, our youth typically don't want to learn to do. But there's people from other com countries that would be delighted to come in here and do it. I wanted to show you a, a slide. How about uh, sure. I, I share a screen here for a minute? Sure thing. <clears throat> so tell me when that uh, comes up. Uh, yeah. Is that up? Yeah, it's up. Is it... Unemployment rates by educational attainment in 2021. Yes, this is something that just really irritates me. There's, there's, uh, if you if you went on the Department of Labor and Department of Education websites, the federal level, you'd find a chart like this in a dozen places, and then you'd find it replicated at the universities, at the state level, the city level telling everybody they should go and, and get a, uh, a university degree because this shows how how income goes up with number of degrees it starts at the bottom with no high school high school uh, some college no degree associate bachelor's master you know it says income goes up unemployment rates go down and and I've been trying to educate them to do better on this because uh, what they should be showing is right around the bachelor's degree, they should be showing the income of people who've passed an apprenticeship, the income of people who uh, have uh, uh, maybe five credentials from NIMS or MSSC or someone like that, because because it's 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 equal to the bachelor's degree. And the uh, I was talking to somebody at a at a manufacturing shop. He said the average worker on their floor was actually making ninety three thousand dollars a year including overtime. Now, lots of probably working 60 hours a week, but still okay. winding up, winding up with, you know, 93 hours. And you know, I've been a white collar worker all pretty much all my life. And I worked 60 hours a week and nobody was paying me any overtime, right. you know. So, people work less than 60 hours a week. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I, I think that, you know, the government should be, should be including that. And, and we're, we're, I've been trying to convince the Department of Labor to do it. With, with with only small success, but right now I've got several groups I'm working with. Uh, for example, the PMA Precision Metal Forming Association 
and, and one or two other similar groups. And, and, and I think we're going to wind up creating our, our, a refined version of this chart that, that has for their industry that number in there, the, the average w income of, of people who are apprentices. And it won't just be the tool makers who have apprenticeship brokers, but also the tool makers who are now the foreman and are now the vice president or are now the owner because their background is an apprenticeship as a, whereas the income for people with degrees, their background is a degree and, and they've risen some of them all the way to the top of the top of the heap. So, so we think this is a, a great opportunity for uh, communities, for companies, trade associations to adapt this concept. And, and I hope within a month or two, I'll have the first version of that done with PMA or another group. And then we'll, then we'll be able to We'll have a, a template that other groups could put right. their number into. Okay, so I, I and then we'll, we'll and we'll get it on the show when it when yeah. it comes out. Yeah. A couple, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had the uh, president of the six o one welders union in Minnesota on the show, mm -hmm. and he was talking primarily about the uh, apprentice uh, program that they have. It's a five-year program, it's a long time, but you learn all the skills, you're getting paid the whole time, you're getting benefits the whole time, and when you get your certificate at the end of five years, you're making $90,000 a year. So here you are now, 26, 27 years old, and you're making 90 grand a year, and you're first starting out. You're doing great. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. How many people yeah. at 26 can say that? <laughs> In the... If you go to these government websites, I'm talking about federal government. If you look in this at the top, it'll say in the headline, it'll say million dollars more lifetime income versus high school graduate. And then in the tiny print at the bottom, it'll say if you adjust for the fact that you start working five years later with a degree and that you have to pay tuition, half of the difference goes away. But they have right. the headline that's overselling the benefit of university and they hide the the relevant data down in the tiny print down at the bottom like if it was a company they you'd say it was fraud <laughs> okay right exactly, exactly. Uh, let, let me show you another slide here see if i can get it down uh let me see here i gotta get over here okay there, there, there's data out there that like this that you can get from the government that shows income as a function of age, horizontal axis age, vertical axis income, as a function of what kind of degree you get. So engineering's at the top and humanities, English and so on, are, are down at the bottom. So this is, so back 20 years ago or so, I took uh, this, that data 30 years ago, and I superimposed the, uh, in the red line, the income of tool and die makers, okay? So a tool and die maker in red, English major down here, and then I took, here's that same data. Here's, here's the tool and die maker. Here's the English major spending money on tuition. I vastly understated it. And then making, but never making as much as the tool maker. And then I, I took half the difference here and I invested it at 7% per year. And so at the age of 49, the tool maker had a million dollars more net worth than the English major. So, so, and yet, if you'd ask the guidance, you know, the school counselor, if you ask the students or the parents, who's going to make more money? Who's going to be wealthier, the the tool maker or the English major? Oh, of course, the English major. That's a university degree. Not true, as as this shows. So, this is the kind of data that the government, the t schools, should be giving to the to the students, so they can make a, a more informed decision. I think that the perhaps parents need to be better educated also because you know they all their friends their kids are in college and you don't want your kid to be a blue collar worker earning a hundred thousand dollars a year you want them to have the piece of paper that hangs on the wall alongside the debt of two hundred thousand, <laughs> if he graduates, because forty percent of kids that go to college don't graduate, and they still have the debt, <laughs> and they still have the debt, and then they go to a trade school, so they're starting years behind. Yeah, I, I think I I told you my story about uh, 
Milwaukee Area Technical College, a, yeah. a, a big uh, community college up in Milwaukee. And, and they, they're the second largest graduate school or graduate institution in Wisconsin, because even though there's a dozen or more universities that give out graduate degrees, there's more people who already have a bachelor's degree at Milwaukee Area Technical College than, than there are at any other university in Wisconsin, except for Madison, the, the, the flagship of uh, University of Wisconsin. So thousands of people with degrees coming back to, to learn a trade so that they can pay off their college debt and, and make a good living. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway. it's quite quite amazing. And, and this, as you pointed out, school counselors really aren't helping the cause. They're doing their job, but they're not doing the job the best they could for the students. Right. A couple other things that the community and state can do is keep costs reasonable. So I, I've read articles about companies in 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 one state and the state said, hey, build build your new factories here. Don't go somewhere else. And, and the company said, you, you are so fiscally irresponsible that if I build another factory here, my workers in my factory are going to be taking on billions of dollars of your debt to pay off. And whereas if I go to the other state, I, there's just not a problem. So why should I build a factory here? So, so if you want jobs there, if you want companies to commit and hire apprentices and train them and invest, keep the spending under control keep, so, that, so that the company doesn't feel they're being uh, pulled down by the irresponsibility of the government. One, one plan that I heard, and uh, by the way, you, you want to take down the uh, slide so we could see. I, I, let, me, let me show you, as long as we've got it up, I'll, I'll, show oh, you okay. one, I'll, show, I'll show one more slide just sure. to uh, get them done with. So this is uh, cities and states can also work with their companies to understand the virtue of reshoring. So this is a chart uh, we've had it on the show before. And this shows the, the comp how competitive the U.S. is, for example, with China. So here's uh, China as a percentage of U.S. And the blue is price, so FOB price, so the factory price. Red is total cost of ownership, so include, including not just price, but duty and freight and carrying cost of inventory and intellectual property risk and so on, risk of stocking out and you lose the order. And then yellow includes a 15% Section 301 Trump tariff, and the tariffs are actually more like 25%. The key thing is when you go from price, the, where the eight the U.S. wins 8% of the time to total cost 32% of the time, and if there's one of these tariffs, 46 or 50% of the time, so companies can help their states, cities can help their companies understand that 20, 30% of what the companies are now importing, they can make more profitably right where they are in the in the city, in the state. And, 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 and if they do that, that'll bring jobs back. Kids will see that manufacturing, once again, is a great career, and that'll help to solve the education problem that we were talking about. Well I'm said. Back. Well said. <laughs> uh, it's... Um... It, it seems as though that um, the educate, you know, in Europe, for example, they have apprenticeship programs as part of their educational system. You go to school for X number of days to, for liberal arts and math and so on and so forth. And then a couple of days a week, you're going for apprenticeship training. And that program, particularly in, in uh, Germany, uh, is where uh, I think that actually started the apprenticeship program. And it's worked. It's worked for Europe for, you know, uh, 150 years. And uh, hundreds of years. I think hundreds of years. You know, it comes out of the guild system back back in the, whatever, 1500s, 1600s. Yeah. Yeah. But, but G Germany is exceptionally good. The Swiss are equally good at that. Uh, Austria, it's so all those Germanic kind kind of countries, right. uh, uh, very hardworking, very focused. You know, I, I I've taken groups of U.S. apprentices over to see the Swiss system, and and in we we go to some of these mid-sized companies, fifty, a hundred, two hundred fifty people, wonderful apprentice programs, and the 
management of the company is mostly apprentice graduates within the company. So, so, so the apprentice, you know, gets hired sort of from the community. Uh, they, they, they do the apprentice program. They work their way up. They, they know the, the, the product. They know the process. They know the other people in the company. They know the customers. And they eventually become the vice presidents and the presidents of the company, as opposed to flying in a, you know, a Harvard MBA to tell them all how to do it. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a story that uh, Tim Grady and I, who's my co-host on Manufacturing Talk Radio, uh, who's not here today, uh, we ran across two companies in Vermont. Vermont clearly has a small population. They don't have a lot of manufacturing. <clears throat> But two manufacturers who are having difficulty getting people to come to Vermont to go to work offered a training, a joint training program, and they had each of their uh, each company donated employees, you know, tool and die makers, machinists, and so on, and they created their own training program, and these uh, trainees would work. At company A for a while, then company B for a while, and switching back and forth. And it was so successful. The only thing was that they made a commitment to each other that you won't steal my employee and I won't steal your employee. Yeah. And they jointly trained kids to do manufacturing on the floor work to the point that outside the state, kids heard about these programs. And they moved to Vermont because they they love Vermont. They love skiing. Yeah. Wow, what's better than making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year? And then when you go off, you can go skiing. Yeah. And it's worked very successfully now for about three, four years. So companies have to start thinking out of the box. Think uh, creatively. I know a similar program in uh, uh, Charlotte. Uh, there's a group. Uh, uh, that, that has, I know a mold maker there, a very good mold maker, and, and but but five or ten other companies, including some pretty big companies, and and they they collectively would promote the apprenticeship program. They bring them in, they'd move back and forth, between, then they'd pick you know who who goes where, and and the nice thing at this mold maker that I know, the uh, it may be 25, 30 employees, and the average age of all employees in the company was about thirty five. You know, it was a lot of time. A lot of time. The you, you, best investment that the company could possibly make, best investment a city or state could make, is, is in their workforce. Well, I went, went to, on reshoring, which obviously what brings me here. The uh, I spoke uh, last week to, again to the Precision Metal Forming Association, and and they had about uh, 25, 30 of their members, member companies at this event, and about nine of them. Had uh, had reshored, you know, had, had and some of them a million or millions of dollars worth of work each. So so you know, I, it's it's the best hit rate, you know, the the highest rate of activity of, of the groups I've ever spoken to. So I'm 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 delighted to have such a such such good results and and look forward good to success. reporting it to you in the future. Good success, uh, Harry. Before we uh, wrap this up, uh, do you have any? Uh... Uh, additional last comments uh, you'd like to make uh, regarding uh, this topic? So uh, Reshoring Initiative is, we're, we're at www.reshorenow.org. So communities and cities, uh, states, companies, you know, if, if you've succeeded in reshoring, love to hear about it. You can, if you report a case we don't know about, you can win the Manufacturing is Cool t-shirt made in the U.S. out of U.S. cotton. And if you need our help, if you've got a company that's that's thinking about reshoring, or maybe worse, thinking about offshoring, call on us to provide the tools to convince them to stay or to come. Well said, Harry. Now I know why they all love you. Everybody <laughs> loves Harry. Harry, thank you very much for your input uh, today, last month, the month before, and so on and so forth. We hope to have you back uh, next uh, next month as well. And uh, uh, our listeners, you can uh, listen to all of Harry's uh, shows on 
Manufacturing Talk Radio, as well as mine. Uh, we have a total of uh, about 750 shows now. And we also are now beginning to syndicate where we're going to be uh, nationwide on AM, FM radio. Uh, we are on one radio station now up in Hornell, Hornell New York. And uh, that's uh, WLEA. And uh, for a town of 8,500, and we wind up with 15, 20,000 listeners. I don't know where they're getting them from. Maybe they're just clicking a lot. I don't know. <laughs> but it's working. And uh, if anybody's interested in doing uh, advertising, we are starting an advertising uh, campaign. And you can see the uh, e email address over my right shoulder. And I'd be happy to talk to anyone about being a guest, about advertising. Uh, if you want to reach out to some people and don't know how to contact them, contact me and I'll put you in touch. Harry, you want to give your email address one last time? www.reshorenow.org. Okay. And Mosier on Manufacturing will end now. Thank you all. Thank you, Harry. See you next month. Bye, Lou. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. I'm just wild about Harry.